Mike McFall, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I'm delighted to finally get you here. Yeah, this is great. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, man, I, I, love, I love to create content with people like with such great experience and great backgrounds like yours. So it's a privilege for me to have you on here. Um, so I guess, you know, without further ado, as they say, I'd love for you to like introduce yourself to us, you know, who you are, what you do, and most importantly, how you got to where you are today. Most important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I've been in my business for almost 30 years now. Uh, we started it back in, in uh, 1995 and you know, the, the, you know, my, my business, um, doesn't, isn't me. It doesn't define me. I, I manage it. I love it, but, uh, you know, I'm a dad and a husband first. So I've got four kids and I've got a beautiful wife and, and, uh, you know, I'm in the midst of all of that. So I have a, I have an 18 year old, a 17 year old, a seven year old and a four year old. Right. So it's, a uh, my house is a hot mess. My, my wife likes to say that, you know, we're, we're in condoms and diapers all at the same time with our children, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but so, so my family and my, 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 uh, my, my personal life takes up the majority of my attention. Uh, I'm fortunate. I've, the business has gotten to the point where I don't manage the business day in and day out anymore. Uh, and we have a team of people uh, who are running it. Uh, we have a president who has been a dear friend of mine for well over 20 years. Uh, he came on board five years ago when he sold his business. Uh, we brought him on and he spent the last five years developing the team that's going to lead this company into the future. Uh, my business partner and I, I have a, I'm very fortunate to have a, a business partner, Bob Fish. Uh, we, we, or we're equal partners in the business. Uh, we're co-CEOs of the company. And uh, and so what that's provided me and Bob is the opportunity to pursue some some really important uh, passions outside of the day-to-day -day of our business. Uh, mine falls into the, the genre of leadership, um, entrepreneurship and leadership. Uh, my, my partner uh, is deep into the farm direct business model. And so wow. he's, he's spending his time uh, foraging the world, uh, looking for the kinds of partners that we can feel great about partnering with and buying coffee from and so on. And so that's where we are. The business is, um, you know, we've definitely reached the point of, of what I would call sustainability. You know, I, we don't worry about whether we're going to be around uh, tomorrow or not. Uh, what we're focused on, though, is building a company that's going to be here in 100 years, 200 years or 300 years, uh, living up to the values and the purpose that we've we've laid down for ourselves. That's awesome. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it must be, I guess, like somewhat more relaxing that you don't have to worry so much about keeping the lights on every night now that there's like a sustainable model there. Yeah, it is. But again, you know, I'll, I'll remind you, it's been 30, almost 30 years. <laughs> so I certainly hope we would be there, you know, uh, but it is, it is the, from that perspective. Yes. Uh, but what I'm finding at least for me personally in my own psyche is that, you know, when you're running a company, you, you have things to do. You, you are, you're, you're fully engaged in what's happening. Uh, and in many ways, the business sort of sets your, your schedule and your, your priorities today. It's almost more complicated uh, because there isn't anything pressing. And so you wake up in the morning and you really, I really do have to, you know, sail my own ship here and figure out yeah. where I should be spending my time and what, what's the most valuable place for me to be. And, you know, that, that, that is complicated in its own way. You know, I guess as well, you know, using the ship metaphor, at least you have opportunities to dock at any country you want, you know? That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm definitely not complaining about my life. <laughs> I'm not complaining, but you know, no, when you start looking at, you know, for a while it was survival and then it was, you know, really build a sustainable enterprise and, and become, um, stable and profitable and, and so on. Uh, today it's now become more about having impact. Well, and, uh, yeah. and so that, that's the measure now. And, and so there's almost more pressure there, uh, because you don't want to, I don't want to be the kind of leader that, yeah, I built a company, but you know, then I went on this quest to have impact and then I failed miserably <laughs> at having impact, you know? No, totally. I didn't mean, you know, I guess like kind of jumping off from impact. I mean, we mentioned we when we spoke offline there last week, you know, you've kind of found yourself into academia now. And, you know, I guess like having impact on next generation um, founders, next generation entrepreneurs. 
I mean, espousing the virtues of sort of sustainable sort of business growth and development is obviously something near and dear to your heart. I mean, I guess like when I think about, you know, having impact, I mean, you're kind of getting naked on the stage, so to speak, again, you know, starting a business is very naked, sort of like you have to like corral people into believing your sort of vision to get to a point where it's growing. And I guess like here you are in the next phase of your life and you're getting up on stage and you're trying to do it all again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my next quest. So, so I've, I've, um, I've written two books and they were linear and it was, the first one was about business startup. It's called grind. And that takes you into the ethos, the mindset of what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. And that's the point. That's, that was the, what I'm trying to accomplish with that book. Then I, then the second book took over in that bootstrapping entrepreneurial phase where, you know, you, you have a business, it is, it is, uh, working and then you need to transition out of the mindset of, you know, a strict entrepreneur into what might be called a leader. And so, uh, that transition is, is a, is a long and difficult and arduous transition for most entrepreneurs. And then where I want, where the end of that book leads us off in, you've built a sustainable enterprise. And by definition, sustainable means you, you are irrelevant to the future success of the company. And that's where I find myself today. Um, I don't yeah. know that we're irrelevant to the, the future success, but we, we are definitely on our way to that, right? Uh, and, and the path's yeah. pretty clear. The next book, picks up it and it's a call to action around leadership and around what it means to be a leader and my definition of a leader is if you consider yourself a leader when you're managing a business and the idea is to maximize the productivity and and return on value of that particular enterprise I don't think you're a leader. I think you're a manager of that asset. Yeah. And then what I, where I'm going is, is that a leader is about having positive social impact on the world. And that we as leaders of private enterprise, that private enterprise is the most powerful force on the planet. The corporation is the most powerful force on the planet. And so yeah. we, we as leaders, we need to engage that power and we need to have impact and improve the human condition. And that's on us and that's leadership. And that's what I'm asking for. And that's what my third book is going to be about. It's, you know, it's, I, I'm just curious now, cause you know, it's, you, you'd mentioned like, say like this form of leadership, but then you said the difference between like, say what comes to mind for me is, you know, almost like an accountant and somebody who manages an asset, you know, you see people in ones and zeros and then asking people to kind of take on a full sort of like, we mentioned this before, like human centric vision of like what it takes to be a leader. I guess you're able to see that now because you just said that you're kind of like out of it, so, so to speak, when you're admired in it, is there, a larger difficulty in being able to see, you know, the wood through the trees, so to speak. Yeah, I think I don't think you're. There's certain phases of the business where you're not worried about this yeah. stuff. You know, I mean, for sure, uh, startup phase and early, early phase too. You know, like you. you but um, my argument in the world is that a organization that's focused on human centric leadership, which is about developing the human being that works for you works with you that what we need to do is we need to unlock people we need to unlock yeah. what i'm calling their 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 inner superpowers and that's leadership and when you do that you unlock massive amounts of capacity so yeah. you can sell more widgets more profitably and have excess capacity to take on some meaningful challenge in the world and what I invite leaders to do is take on that one thing. You don't have to take on everything. Take on something that's meaningful to you and then do that, right? Uh, and when you've unlocked your people and you've got this, what I call a pod of superheroes that show up to work every day, they will figure out how to sell an abundance of widgets more than you probably ever imagined you could sell 
and they can fuel the quest, your, 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 your social endeavor. Right. And so like, and they want that, they want that quest. The, the, the human being wants that challenge. If it's just about showing up to work, to sell more widgets, yeah. to make the rich guy richer, that's not inspiring. Now people do it. They take a paycheck, they go home, but that's not inspiring. When you unlock somebody is when you let them know what the true quest is. What is the quest we're on here? And this isn't about underperforming as a business. This is about performing at an extraordinarily high level, a higher level than your company's ever performed at before. And so that is, that's what we're talking about here. We're not sacrificing anything in relation to the standard uh, business metrics and business performance. Yeah. The overall, the overall theme is, is the work I'm doing. It's not about, I mean, I want to build companies that are optimized, that are performing at the highest levels from all metrics. And, and when you, when you unlock people, when you unlock their superpowers, that's what you can do. And so to ask somebody, like I had a, a, a friend of mine who is just really shooken up, uh, shaken up by the, by school shootings. Right. Like he, it's, it, it's like, he can't get it out of. It. And so he, he's like, can I do something with that? I'm like, absolutely. Like, yes, exactly. Like you feel passionate about that. Do that. Right. Whatever it might be, take that on and do it. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and I guess like, you know, it's interesting, as well, especially as well, coming from coffee, because I guess like you've kind of had a passion for coffee for a long time. You know, it's over 30 years now and we've kind of hit that sort of fair trade sustainability kind of coffee You in that era of people understanding sort of where the beans are coming from and fair wage and, uh, you know, all the kind of stuff that kind of goes into what is now almost like a normal practice in coffee, but you've kind of come up to that way. Do you think that inspired you to think about your leadership in that way? No, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that inspired my leadership. I, I, I think that most of the certifications out there, fair trade, you know, and, and or, you know, all the, the certifications that we feel good about as consumers, most of that stuff's bunk. It really, truly <laughs> really is, right, as yeah. we get into it. And so we're creating our own certification process. Uh, yeah, that is, that's deep, right? Like, uh, and, and there's a lot of risk in that for us, you know, like, it's a lot easier just to grab some third party certification and say, Hey, we're, we're good. We're good corporate citizens, you know, we yeah. buy and, um, but when, when we dive into it, at the end of the day, most of those certifications are marginal at best. Uh, and we're creating something totally different, but yeah, the, the coffee trade isn't what inspires me. What inspires me is the opportunity we have as leaders to have dramatic impact on people. And people are showing up to work. We can create an environment for them that they can thrive within and that they can, yeah. like work is the most beautiful Petri dish for self-improvement because you've got challenging, you've got challenging work. You've got people around you that if you enroll them will support you in your own development, leadership should be facilitating that. And if we do, at the end of the day, people are going to show up to work and they're going to be dynamic. It's going to be, it's going to be, you know, a beautiful engagement. And we have that opportunity. We're squandering that opportunity as leaders, the days. And by the way, the days of treating the employee like a transaction, they're over, yeah. they're over. And if that's your mindset, you're archaic and you're going to be left in the dust. I guess, you know, it's interesting. And this is like triggering a thought to me as well. Like, I mean, what, how do you view what's happening? Say like Silicon Valley companies that are letting go of say 20% of the company, like overnight that have had years of explaining that they're part of the family, that this is, you know, we will provide laundry and we provide food. And it's like one communal sort of effort to realize a vision of these sort of solopreneurs. I mean, like, you know, that they might be public companies, but the whole control is in the power of a founder. Yeah. And I mean, I, that I mean, there then, not that I want to disqualify it, but it's like, it's interesting because it's like that message, that I feel like the message at the moment to your point is a bit kind of blurred now. Well, you're, if somebody offered me the CEO's job at Starbucks and, you know, $50 million worth of shares in Starbucks to sign on. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. 
the reason is is the structure is disgusting the structure is sick right yeah when you are running a publicly traded company you are beholden to the capital markets and you signed up for that right like there's i'm not blaming anybody here when you go yeah. public you are saying i this is the game i want to play and they look at short-term results now that i believe a lot of this is changing though because i don't think that long run we're going to be able to manage companies the way we're managing them today with the short-term scope and so when we prove out that the human centric leadership model outperforms the traditional metrics that we've been looking at for the last 50 years they're got leaders are going to have to change whether you're running a public traded company whether you're running a university whether you're running in government doesn't matter what organization you're running yeah. when, when when we when we have the ability to prove out that the human centric leadership model dramatically outperforms the traditional model we're going to be that's that's when we're going to see a sea change because as a ceo of a public traded company if you're if you're still operating in the old in the old ethos you're going to you're going to get you're going to get dismantled as a company in my opinion and i mean it's it's a bold statement but i believe it i believe it's 100 percent true because i think that the privately held companies that are treating their people like this are going to outperform it's interesting i mean i think like i don't know why bill belichick came to my head as the best as an example of that in the sense that it seems like you know i feel like there's very much like a darwinian view on like winning and losing especially in like corporate america you know yeah. and i say we kind of hold up the sort of absolute meritocratic performance of like professional sports as like you win or you lose and there's no middle ground and someone like Belichick getting let go this year and still not finding a job not that I support the Patriots or anything but I think about it a lot in the sense that like you know results don't go your way like the biggest line item is your people and they're gone you know what I mean yeah. without an opportunity to like really kind of delve into like is it the product? Is it the marketing? Is it, you know, there's any number of other reasons. Is it trends? You know, like, what are you trying to look for? And especially in hospitality, you know what I mean? And I think like, you know, there is an enormous, um, almost onerous amount of uh, impact on frontline staff in hospitality, given that they're all like sort of our majority, like hourly wage, you know, stores kind of come and go. And it almost like feels like an accordion and I guess like, you know, I'm trying to like, I, when I'm thinking about it here, it's like, it seems like we're kind of, come, we're in this sort of era of figuring this part out. I guess like, you know, you're obviously a trailblazer in this and trying to espouse the virtues of sort of human centric leadership. And when I think about say companies and tech companies in particular you know it's like you talk about like revenue as sort of like your absolute revenue and growth as like sort of the two metrics and sort of the only human metric that people kind of look at is like an mps score you know that gets reported in everybody's you know uh and everybody's like say public reports their quarterly reports it gets reported in every investor report and i'm like that if that's like the sole thing you're tracking which is like sort of like a preference driver it's like what is the met like what are the kind of metrics that we can see shift people's mindset from looking at bare bones revenue, cut like top line costs versus like into this new era of looking at a human centric leadership and trying to figure out a way of like quantifying it, so to speak, to like move the needle in the discussion. Yeah, I, I mean, the worst we struggle, we're struggling with that every day. I mean, that's yeah. because what it, what is the metric? Our, our purpose for our organization is to support you in building a life you love. And so if we have contact with you, Bigby Coffee has contact with you, our purpose is to support you in building a life you love. It, you know, it works for our customers, works for our franchise owners, works for our baristas, works for our home office employees and so on. And that that is a, you know, so so like turnover as an example, as a, yeah. as a is something you could look at. But we also have this concept in our world called graduation. The people graduate from our company yeah. and they move on to something that they're extraordinarily passionate about. And that's a beautiful thing, right? That's not, that's not a bad thing. Um, and, and so the, the metrics that I want to look at are the metrics around productivity and production. I want to look at efficiency. I want to look at, you know, the, the standard metrics and at the same time though, like what is the mindset of our people? And yeah. I want to do wellness checks. 
I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm boy, am I deep into something right now that I'm hoping is going to work, which is, uh, I can't just, well, I, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's a, it's, <laughs> a, it. <laughs> it's an application that I want to use with our people, right? Where you check in as often as you want check in three times a day, check in once a week, check in. But I want to begin to see a rhythm around this concept of wellness. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's mental health, it's uh, vitality, it's all this. And so those are the metrics that I want to start really dialing into, because yeah. I think if, if we can start to represent that wellness as a category and all the subsets of wellness, that we're improving those as a company, I'm going to, I'm basically betting everything I own on the fact that we're going to see extraordinary performance at the corporate yeah. level too. Like material, and, like and so if you, what else is there to look at, you know? And, and so that is, that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And I, and, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that I want to do in relation to wellness that is, you know, I hope going to be powerful. And improve the improve because it's not just track. We got to improve the metrics too. So, you know that that's that's the that's what I look at. And why wouldn't we? I mean, all companies are is an assemblage of people that yeah. are interacting day in and day out. And if you're improving the wellness scores of your population of people, I mean, I'm making a bit of a leap to they're going to be more efficient, more productive in their environment, and it's going to improve the results of the company. You know, it's interesting. I mean, wellness is like, you know, like as a category, I mean, it's so nascent just as a sort of consumer ideology in and of itself and like really trying to figure out how to bring that into the workplace. You mentioned, you know, when we spoke on the phone last week, you know, like you're big on like sort of due diligence of yourself, you know, mm -hmm. it was the concept of your book. And it's like, you know, I would, I, I guess I'm taking a leap here. It says you obviously did due diligence of yourself and we're like, okay, I see wellness, I partake in sort of this wellness ideology, and I can feel that it will have benefits for the rest of the company. Well, um, the, you know, the concept of due diligence on yourself is I just had I just had a conversation with a woman that works for us this morning. And, and my point to her, she's struggling with some relationships, you know, and my point to her was, hey, listen, you got to own 100% of each relationship you have. And, and, and if you aren't willing to do that, and you're going to sit back and you're going to blame, you're going to blame others for the relationships you have with them, like you're not going anywhere. <laughs> the world's just not going to yeah. work for you, right? And, and my, my point in saying that is, is like due diligence on yourself is understanding how you're interacting with the world how you're interacting with your team, how you're interacting with your people. And, and so the, this piece of due diligence, I've never seen it written before. I've never seen it drawn up in a business text before, which is the key ingredient to the success of the organization is the leader. Yes. And, and so the leader has to do the due diligence on themselves to understand how they're impacting the business. And if they aren't doing that work, they're not going to be able to effectively lead. And so that's the concept of due diligence on yourself. And then it works for anybody in the organization, right? It's like, hey, listen, if you're struggling with something, it's on you. Like you got to figure it out, right? How to, how to interact differently and better with the people around you to get the end results you want and in a healthy way. So, but I've never seen this. I've never seen this before, this, this concept of due diligence on yourself. And, and I, and I love the, I love it. Right. Um, and when we approach the world from that perspective, that I've got to learn and grow, that I need to be the leader. My organization needs me to be. Now we're starting to talk about second to me, what's second level, right? You're leveling up leadership. Uh, it's interesting though, you know, when you think about like say due diligence though, because there, I feel like, um, in one sense, I feel like there's an enormous amount. I've been I've been witness to you. I've been in a couple of startups now that have raised a lot of venture capital from very sort of like tier one investors. And I feel like, a lot, especially as I kind of graduated up my career, I've seen the leaders I've worked with go into programs to do this sort of due diligence, self awareness work. What works for them as like sort of leaders, what doesn't, areas to improve, and very like in depth sort of 
psychosocial sort of uh, reviews of themselves that are very intimate, you know? And I remember thinking, wow, like that's like, you know, like so much homework that they would have to do over a long period of time to figure that out. And I do remember a friend of mine left, was at McKinsey and worked, left with a partner to set up a sort of app training on this sort of idea as well. I'm not sure if it ever kind of took off, but like, I feel like the sort of push for due diligence really stems from a sort of recent understanding that you can never stop learning. You can never stop moving. I think, you know, when you think about the great leaders in sports and the great leaders in politics or the great leaders, like what they're great at is actually compromising on ideals to learn and improve things. Like, I mean, you know, we have bad politics because people don't want to learn and people don't want to compromise. We have, you know, football coaches don't work because, or players, like, I mean, great players and the, or great sportsmen will compromise to make something happen for themselves. I heard a great thing, which is like root of threes, which is like a third of the time you're happy with your performance. A third of the time you're disgusted with your performance and a third of the time you're just meh. And that's what makes an Olympic athlete. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, when you think about like, you know, like if you think about the due diligence yourself, like 66% of the time at that high, like high performance, you're not really happy with where you're at. You know, but it's being able to manage that sort of mindset and be aware and try to improve and those kinds of things, I think is kind of interesting. Um, I think a lot about like, you know, especially for me, I guess, you, I, I hope I am one of the people that would be, if I wasn't doing this podcast, I would hear the way you're talking about this and thinking about due diligence in the sense that like, there's so much more for me to improve, but at the same time, it's having a consistent learner mindset and being willing to like try and change for the better to like yeah. do be honest and be intimate with yourself about shortcomings and be honest about, you know, areas that you're like thriving in, you know, and trying yeah. to improve them both. Well, you know, and, and most of the VCs that I know, and, you know, I'm, I'm privy to a few pretty high profile ones here in Ann Arbor that have done very well. Yeah. Uh, they, it was amazing to listen to them. The idea when someone brings them the idea, the idea is, a small part of the analysis and a huge part of the analysis is the entrepreneur, the leader and the team. And, you know, the, I was talking to this one guy and he said, you know, I funded a group and they, they had some success and then they came back a second time and I funded them again. And then they had, you know, even better success. He said the third time they came back to me, I, didn't ask a thing. And all I was doing is trying to scramble and try to find my checkbook, <laughs> you yeah. know? And so this concept of it being about, it's, it's about the people. It, it, and, yeah. and, and so I think so few understand that concept and leadership is too, like leading a company is a hundred percent about the people. And until we get that piece figured out, I hear this bullshit comment from entrepreneurs or leaders where they say, you know, I can manage my company from a spreadsheet. Yeah, you can, you can manage it right into the ditch. Right. And, and I believe that, right. You can't manage a company from a spreadsheet, right. The, the nuance and the intricacies and the, the, the power that you're leaving available inside of your organization, you're not leading at that point. You're managing, you're a manager, of an asset and you think you can manage that asset from a spreadsheet and that that line just always has bugged me always driven me crazy well it's interesting because you know when you hear of like say fast growing businesses whether it's software or their coffee you know like something that's growing exponentially that you need like your doers you need your people that you can just trust to kind of do the job and Obviously, that stems from like great hiring, identification of talent, great referrals, whichever, whichever, whichever. But if I think about it, you know, you're talking about like relationships. If like, how does a CEO, how do you think a great leader manages the spreadsheet, but also empathy in that kind of situation? Because it's like, you got to grow and you want A players, you know, and you don't want B or C players if you want to hit that sort of escape velocity, so to speak. So like, where's the sort of managing of sort of like, the empathy because is empathy born inside you or is it trained for something? I don't know that empathy, I mean, empathy is, is, is a really, you know, is a, is a hot topic at the moment, you know, um, 
to me, it's not about, it's not, a, it's, I'm struggling with the word empathy, but I, let me just, I'll just tell you a story. Um, yeah. A friend of mine, a friend of mine has done, two, has done two um, startups, you know, that just extraordinary. I, I, I think he's top three entrepreneurs in the state of Michigan. I would never embarrass him by, by saying because he, he would kill me. Um, <laughs> Everyone look this up on LinkedIn right now, you know, <laughs> and he's, uh, he's, he's just an extraordinary guy, you know, and, and he did a, uh, he did a, he did, they weren't startups, but he bought, he bought a company with like $8 million in revenue and, and took it up to over a billion dollar valuation. Yeah, I'm really well. And then he's he's done this a second time. He'll do it a third time if he chooses to, you know, that kind of thing. He's just, he's really yeah. an extraordinary well, leader. Just... And he's, a, he's an incredibly responsible leader. He will tell you 85% of his energy as the CEO of the company goes into his brain. That's a quote. I quote that. 85% of yeah. his energy. And this guy, I mean, I would put his, I would put his entrepreneurial capability up against anybody's. You know, looking at his track record, and uh, and so, you know, two billion dollar exits. It's just extraordinary, and and eighty five percent of his energy goes into his people. That doesn't mean he's easy to work for. Holy shit! This isn't about being nice. This isn't about yes. you know being empathetic. This is about engaging your people and meeting them where they need to be met. You might, you know, like I talk about, you might walk in on a given morning and like you might have to go into a into a sales meeting and you might have to get red in the face, pissed off over the fact that, you know, certain metrics weren't hit that we set as, as really important targets for this quarter or this, this six months or this year. Like that's part of the job. And that's, but that's people oriented, right? Like you're going into yeah. this and then you might have to, you, you know, on, from that meeting on your way to your office, you stop in and you have to ask a, a woman how her nephew who got in a car accident over the weekend is doing. And there she is in tears, right? You might have to support her. And then you might have to go work on, you know, so, and then on your next meeting might be with your banker, you know, like, 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 but it's all people. It's all about yeah. the impact you're having as a leader on people. And, and that would be my friend's, my friend's uh, position is it's, it's 85% people. And, and you don't, you don't drive that through spreadsheets. Yeah. I guess, you know, and also spreadsheets don't see like, you know, like bias. And, you know, we talk a lot about, you spoke about that the last time as well, which is like, you know, like you talk about embracing bias in sort of like your leadership. Yeah. And it's interesting because again, that doesn't really show up as a line item. You know what I mean? It's like- It doesn't show up any, I mean, it's impossible, like, right? Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, you know, but it's a huge component oh, yeah. of separating good from great. You know, we talk a lot about like diversity of opinion, diversity of voices, diversity of opportunity, you know, diversity of leadership, but it doesn't really show up anywhere. You know, it doesn't show up as kind of anything, you know what I mean? But it exists in the sort of like quasi intangible sort of force of nature for companies that have it versus those that don't. And like, you know, I guess, you know, when I think about like your own leadership style, and I know you're like very keen on like really espousing the virtues of this as well, which is like, you know, how would you think about designing programs to, you know, embrace bias um, within sort of leadership groups? First and foremost, you've got to build an extraordinary amount of trust that you, you, you can't interrogate people's reality and truth without trust. And that's what we're talking about doing when you're talking about bias is when someone has a bias, it's their truth. <laughs> you, you, that's yeah. the truth, right? So, so when you want to interrogate that, you're interrogating their truth. And the only way you can do that is when you've got a really, really well-established trusting relationship. So that's first and foremost, is you've got to build that, right? You got to build that within your teams, not only with you as the leader, with each member, you got to build the trust amongst the the team as well and they have to have trusting relation the uh, trusting relationship so that's first like that's how you do it and how do you build trust it starts with you it starts with you taking uh, and being willing to be somewhat vulnerable with your team it it's about you disclosing the stuff that you're working on personally and being willing to open up 
It's about you talking about your challenges and things that are, you know, so many approach leadership from the perspective of that they have to be all powerful and they have yeah. to have the answers. And they, and it's like that, that's actually 180 degrees from where you should be as a leader, right? You shouldn't be sitting in your chair thinking you've got it all figured out. You've got the answers. You know, I, I love this concept of when you hear leaders talk about, you know, I'm going to go ahead and let them skin their knee so they can learn that lesson. We've all like heard that. that, right? Yeah. There's a presumption there that you know the answer. And that's because, <laughs> right. And you don't know the answer. Yeah. How do you? And so what I what I advocate is the group is smarter than you are. And if you can't get your head around that as the leader, you're going to be in big trouble. Because if you don't believe that, you believe your brain, your experience is the only place that you can get answers, right? So, so that's what I mean by, by building trust. When you talk about the group being smarter than you, what I've, I've just got done recently talking to my, my, my executive leadership team about the fact that we hired them and they better be better at this than we were. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like they better. I mean, we are, now we have specialized leaders in categories. Like they better be better at this than we are. They better be smarter than us. Now we're here for historical context. We're here if they want our opinion, but at the end of the day, it's on them. They got to run the business. And so uh, full circle on that. When, when you treat the leadership team as if they are smarter than you and you are depending on them and that you trust them and you've built the trusting relationships and then you've worked to facilitate those internally, that's when you can interrogate reality. That's when you can interrogate bias. But until you have that, you can't because people will just, will just resist immediately if you don't have the trust built. So I guess, you know, if you're, so you're like, I mean, if I'm hearing that, I'm like, okay, I need to hire the best people I possibly can to fit each role. So there's obviously identifying criteria within the people you hire beyond like their sort of domain expertise that you can kind of lean into them as sort of the expert. Like, I mean, like I look at myself and I'm like, I'm the head of marketing and the head of growth here. I'm in this position because I've done this for like a long time. And I guess, I guess we didn't see something in me, uh, <laughs> but if I think about it, like, you know, when I go further down that chain and you're hiring more sort of like, you know, middle management and sort of entry level into your company, like, I guess there's the fundamental lack of knowledge exists with them anyway, just to be experience and life experience, professional experience and trying to design that sort of culture for trust then to like, let people to like embrace their bias. I'm curious, like, you know, you've kind of, done this now for so long like what are the ways you think about engendering that trust in sort of the frontline staff in one of the big b coffees for example you know like how do they interpret what you're saying here yeah i mean you know a lot i, I assume there's a, a lot of them out there that would be like this is bunk <laughs> you know like and i do worry about that i do worry about that 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 yeah. if, you know employees will listen to what i'm saying and be like man that's not my experience in this company you know yeah. uh but my partner and I talk about that a lot, that, that this is, this is meant to be aspirational. Yeah. We don't have it done. We're not even close to done, but we're trying and we're trying to move it in a certain direction. And, you know, if we continue to try and we continue to push, I'm building a trusting, supportive, loving, nurturing environment. If we continue to work on that and improve that, you know, 10 years from now, the company is going to be in a much better spot than it is today. And that's the, yeah. you don't just flick a switch and like instantly have these environments built. Like, and by the way, you can erode that trust so quick. I mean, instantly you can erode that trust. And so you spend years and years and years and years building it. And then, you know, yeah. something happens, uh, you know, inside of the organization and you can erode an enormous amount of it very quickly. And that's like, discouraging, you know, uh, as a leader, but it's about trying and it's about working on improving and getting better. And what can we do to build this environment that we aspire to have? And at the end of the day, again, it's just about, you know, give me 10 years and I guarantee you this company's getting better, be better in a better spot than it is. Yeah. Today. So 
you know, from leadership and from like, say, CEO, founder, all the way down to exec team, you know, it sounds like, you know, really emphasizing sort of the vision for the business of who we want to be. And this is how we're going to get there. So it's like, it actually kind of all seems to, and I, I mean, it all makes sense, obviously, but I'm saying it seems to stem from like very clear communication more than anything else. Like, is like leadership really a communication problem? <laughs> like, in many ways, ways it is. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah, in so many ways it is. Uh, you know, I was just, I was just talking to, to a woman in our organization today about like, it's so amazing that oftentimes no matter what you say people hear what they're looking for yeah <laughs> they're they're looking for something in the conversation and you know they're going to be pretty darn good at finding what they want to hear you know and that and so but there's you know there's just there's so many tactics small simple easy tactics that people don't employ very i i think i'm doing a post on social media here tomorrow today or tomorrow around silence and just the pure power of silence and and how most of us just talk all the time we just talk all the time and if we're not talking we're thinking about what we're going to be talking about or what we're going to be saying right and and what silence allows for is it actually allows for people to contemplate and consider it allows for the person who's talking to follow up with more and and when you allow for that you're allowing someone to unfold their entire argument. But what happens and what I see happening in the world everywhere is we're all interrupting each other, right? Trying to, you know, I think I, I I'm 90% sure I understand what the heck you're talking about. And here's my thought on that. Right. But instead of letting it just fully unfold and letting that uncomfortable silence sit so that if somebody has something they want to add that they can, then what's even more important is to, instead of interjecting what you think, interjecting what you think you heard so that at that point the person can confirm. And then when you have that, you have understanding. And then you can confirm that understanding and now you can move forward. That's effective communication. It doesn't happen often in the world. But if you can train your people on that approach, like all of a sudden you're going to start having people feeling like they're being heard because they actually are being heard. And, and so these are simple fundamental tools. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know why the world is so crazy, but like, isn't the point when you're having a conversation with somebody, isn't the point to truly understand what the heck it is that they're trying to tell you? Yeah. But I think there's like a, a race against time to get past context and get down to brass tacks. I feel like that feels like almost like the American way. You know what I mean? Like they kind of cut the craft. Let's, yeah. you know what I mean? And I, I feel like that type of, I see this all the time. I mean, you know, when I'm getting pitched by sales reps, it's straight into like, here's the painkiller. You know what I mean? I'm like, give me the context, man. Like tell me why, <laughs> give me the why we're even here. Why this is like, Get me to the point that like i want to know like as in i don't like if you just go straight to the benefit like it's like i don't really care that about it. i mean there's a million versions of every software oh out absolutely there. you know explain you, know you gotta I mean? like, you gotta explain the pain that you're solving right you gotta make me feel yeah. that pain right totally. <laughs> and then take me on the journey yeah, yeah 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 take me on the journey i'm here for that like and i mean like when you're having conversation like you know i guess like you know it's probably like the, it's like the powerpointification of society almost that like we've kind of the way we communicate is short like I, I give you an example of something i've actually made my team do i think you might address in their weekly summaries i get them to write in full sentences and you might be like why do i do that and they actually thought that was really onerous and i was like imagine i'm not reading this document and somebody else in the company picks this up are they going to understand any of what you're saying here and they're like no and i'm like so why are you writing it that way you know, right. and it's like, write it and get your thoughts down and better writing will make you a better thinker, you know? And I'm trying to like, when people present me numbers, I honestly barely care about a change in a percentage. Like, like personally, I'm like, whatever, like next week will probably be better. It might be worse. This thing is just like very erratic as long as long-term it trends upwards. But what I'm really looking for is the why, 
Like, why did the number move? Like, what did you do to impact that? Like, tell me and unpack that for me. So like when they're like, they, this is why like, I think a lot about like business analytics and people get caught up so much in this stuff is like, I think it takes so much time to get the numbers and to get the visualization that people spend about 90% of the time getting the thing that I don't really care about. And then the 10% of time, which is actually the thought around what it's been, what it's telling you. And so we have this race against time to really communicate the key part of the information where the majority of the time is spent, like actually digging it out, you know, um, I think about that a lot because I think like communication, like for me is what enables sort of like great leaders, especially when I see in younger kind of people, I'm like, are they able to communicate to me their ideas? Are they able to communicate their suggestions? Like the bravery for somebody to be able to come to me, not that I want to say that I'm some stern taskmaster, but like for somebody to come to me with a suggestion or recommendation that's actually thought out, that they can understand the problem so well that they're like, I'm comfortable telling Alex this, that I want to make change. Honestly, I don't think there's anything more proud in my job when that happens. I'm like, okay, it's getting through. They know that they can come and they know what I'm looking for in terms of from them. Because as is you, I sent you the article and I put it in the notes of the podcast. Um, I'm a big believer in people's job specs in growing companies are kind of irrelevant. You know, they talk about when you're a young employee, just get in. It doesn't matter what the job is, just get into a great company, you know? And I think about that a lot in the sense that like, why would you imagine that if I hired you today at 50 people and in nine months time, we are a hundred people, would you expect your job role to be the exact same? Like why I, I, I don't understand the, the stasis sort of component in people's mindsets. So trying to find people who are comfortable knowing that like, okay, you're in marketing today, but in nine months time, I actually can see in you as a great account manager, or customer service person. Like there's a great opportunity for you here to come in and build something amazing. But finding people who are comfortable with that type of change, finding people who are not resistant to quote unquote, giving away Legos, you know, like it takes a lot to find that great talent. And then to your point earlier in the conversation, you talked about unlocking it. Like, how do you think about the human centric side of things to actually unlock the talent that are comfortable enough to come to you and do that in the first place? Yeah, I, I take a contrarian stance on that concept, which yeah. is I don't I don't think everybody talks about finding good people and how hard it is to find good people in the world. And I think that's bullshit. I think it's an excuse for a lack of leadership. And so if you if you are dependent on finding the right person, how about you think about it from this perspective? Create an environment that people come into where they want to be there, where you're unlocking them, they are you're leading them and it it is it is your job as the leader to turn it their performance is your responsibility. And that's a transition in thinking. So yeah, you can spend time and I, you know, I hear about it constantly. It's like the meme in the world, which is you're trying to find that right person for that right role, trying to find good yeah. people. It's so far, it's so hard to attract people to Michigan. I hear that all the time, right? It's so hard to attract people to Michigan and, and so on. It's like, it's like, well, yeah, like you, that, but, but how about this? How about create an environment where they want to be here? create an yeah. environment where they're thriving, create an environment where they're unlocked. And you're not going to be sitting around trying to find good people. You're going to have a line of people at your door wanting to work there. That's the culture we got to create. And like, I, I hear about other CEOs, talk to other CEOs and, you know, they'll be in process trying to find a C-level uh, manager. And it's like, you know, they're 15, 18, 24 months into the process. And I'm like, what? what? Yeah, yeah. Like that's insanity, you know? And, and, and like when we, when we post for jobs at our company, I mean, we, I mean, knock on wood, we, we have a laundry list. We have a list of people that are interested. Right. And, and, and so it's, but it, I think it's also about the fact that we've created an environment that people want to be a part of. Well, I mean, I, I think that's the crux of the whole thing, isn't it? Creating an environment where people want to come, where they want right. to thrive, and where they can find opportunity for growth. Um, if you want to I, do that, by the way, I'm going to shameless plug. If you want to create, yeah, get to, you want to create say, that yeah. environment, here's my book. <laughs> <laughs> that's grow 
by Mike McFall. Mike, yeah. man, you're an absolute gent. I appreciate you coming on here so much. It's been a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I do, I do appreciate it. You're a legend. Thank you, man.